If there's a smartphone line that is a little bit of a paradox but still remains interesting, it's the Sony Xperia flagships, and not for the reasons you may think. Sony has an uncanny ability to keep their phones feeling really familiar every year, while pinpointing certain areas where they put a significant amount of effort. It's a rather odd case of tunnel vision, but I think many of the people who stick with Sony smartphones hope that the culmination of all those small steps forward eventually turn into big strides. Well, we have another year and we have another familiar looking phone, but now this might actually be one of the most stacked smartphones that we have seen so far. Hey, it's Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? Here is a first look at the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV. Yep, I said first look. There are a few reasons for that. I've only had this smartphone for a few days so far, and with so much going on in this Xperia, that amount of time is certainly not enough for me to make final insights. Besides, this device in my hand right now is actually a prototype. Functionally, it should still give us a pretty good look at what this is going to offer overall, and I plan to share all of that over time. So you can expect multiple follow-ups as I use the cameras more extensively, enjoy the performance for things like gaming, and I just get to know this phone in general on the daily. But as a prototype device, there are likely going to be certain details and features that are meant to be improved later on. So I'm simply sharing my experience so far with this specific device. If you regularly follow Sony Xperia devices, the design won't provide much by way of many surprises. The flat sides and almost literal candy bar shape returns, and the screen is sporting an aspect ratio that makes this phone quite narrow. Now for a flagship device, it's probably the easiest one to handle one-handed. I actually really enjoy that. The phone does come in a few different colors, but this black edition is pretty classic, with a matted finish on the back that gives it a, a pretty nice feel. This flat frame also houses a bunch of things that you don't usually get in other flagship smartphones. Consider for a moment how not very bloated all these design cues are, and yet the Xperia 1 Mark IV still manages to sport a headphone jack. And also, of course, the extra button here that is used for the cameras. An IP68 rating keeps things running even in wet conditions, and the Xperia smartphone remains one of the only ones that has a SIM tray which doesn't require a tool for removal. And there's a micro SD card slot as part of that tray too, another feature that we pretty much never see in other flagships. If you were hankering for some dramatic change in the design, obviously you're not getting here, and maybe you're a little new to Sony's track record. Personally though, I've never had any issues with the way most Xperias look and feel. They're pretty easy to grip for both typical and for camera use, while managing to provide all of the features that most other manufacturers just no longer prioritize. Do you remember when I said Sony has a track record of picking just a couple details and then going all in with them? Sony Xperia's, for example, were one of the first places where we saw a 4K display. Back when it was first introduced, it wasn't really a necessity, and honestly, it still kind of isn't, but uh, it made its way from being a fringe addition to being a mainstay. The Xperia 1 Mark IV also outfits that high-resolution screen with a high refresh rate, and a ton of different rendering options inspired by the company's Bravia televisions. Now, I haven't and usually don't tinker with all of these color settings, but there are also a lot of settings for like the audio and whatnot. Those are all things that I don't touch too often, because because I find I don't really need to. The experience is enjoyable already out of the box. Now, the rest of the specs are properly updated with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 powering everything with 12 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of onboard storage. And finally, the 5,000 mAh battery marks an increase from before, which is actually impressive given how the phone itself hasn't particularly blown up in size. On the communication front, I haven't really taken any calls over SIM with this phone because I just don't do that a whole lot compared to audio and video calls over messaging platforms. From that standpoint, the audio has sounded fine from the earpiece, but when going to the speaker phones, the dual stereo speakers here have been quite satisfying. That goes for media consumption too. Allow me to give this phone another nod for having dual speakers and a front-facing camera with as minimal bezels as possible and no notch needed. In the past few days with this smartphone, I've gotten back into the Xperia swing of things pretty easily. Their version of Android is pretty straightforward, and most of the Sony Extra applications here have their use cases, putting them just below the threshold of bloatware. Although, of course, that goes mainly for all of the camera-centric apps. You still get a couple of redundancies here and there, like, for example, two different news applications. There is one app that I just can't talk about yet because it's not on here and it won't be accessible for quite some time. It's called Music Pro, uh, and it basically makes the Xperia 1 Mark IV like a dedicated recording suite and can complete with its like onboard mics and all that. And it ties into an AI powered sound enhancement and noise reduction cloud service. There's a lot of stuff going on there, uh, but again, it's not available on here. When it does come out and I can test it out, I'm really interested to see if it could be a viable tool for podcasting in particular. 
And then when playing games, the Game Enhancer gives access to multiple settings and focus toggles, as well as a direct line to even live streaming your gameplay on YouTube, which is brand new to the software. And that's all stuff that I'm gonna get into in future looks, because as per usual with Sony's take on Android, it's easy to use out of the box, with a ton more that you can tinker with underneath the surface. All right, I said an operative word a second ago, tinker. That's a word that I and my peers have used to describe the Sony Xperia smartphone cameras for multiple generations now, and this one is no exception. Now, I'm gonna show some camera samples, but remember, this is a prototype device, and some of the processing and the rendering can probably change before final retail units hit store shelves. What I will say about this camera system right now is that I'm having a lot of fun with it, but that's because I am the kind of person, the tinkerer, that enjoys having the option to take manual control, mainly when the results aren't quite where I want them to be automatically. I mean, that's a common story with Xperia cameras, but then there's this new important detail. The fact that this might be the most advanced and most capable set of camera hardware that we've seen on a smartphone yet. Let me start off with my favorite development. 4K is available on the front now. Now you're gonna max out at 4K at 30 frames per second, so you won't be getting any slow motion selfie videos out of this. However, if you do really need to do that, 1080p at 60 frames per second is available. The angle is a little bit tight, but that's because Sony's stabilization does a good job at the expense of a little bit of a crop. I'm stoked about this upgrade in general, but there is one particular reason. In previous Xperia smartphones, you could maximize the shooting experience by using the vlog monitor and the vlogging grip. Now, they're still available and are compatible with this phone, but if I don't have them on me, I can still do 4K talking heads while seeing myself in the viewfinder, making the vlog monitor a welcome extra rather than an almost necessary add-on like before. Now we can get to the rundown of the rear cameras. All the sensors are 12 megapixels, and they all are different, but they are tuned appropriately for what each lens sets out to do. There are bright enough apertures across the board with optical image stabilization available on the main, I mean the wide, and the telephoto cameras, because in the ultra wide, you usually don't need it when software stabilization can cover the job pretty well enough there. It's the telephoto that brings a little more hardware magic with moving parts that allow it to do optical zoom across 85 millimeters to 125 millimeters effective range. Even for someone like me that doesn't zoom a ton, it's pretty cool because it means you can rest easy knowing that when you do decide to go past the base value of the telephoto, you still have plenty of room for sharp results. But it's on the sensor level with these cameras that things really get a boost, because each and every one on the back now is capable of high-speed readout. The result is native 120 frame per second capture, meaning that you can record straight up 4K 120 with sound and without having to go through that usual pick the part you want to slow down process. The fact that it's available across the board here means you can compromise less in more shooting scenarios. And it's not the only feature that is available across all three sensors. HDR video recording can be turned on throughout, adding a boost of color and dynamic range. For the video nerds out there, it's based on the BT2020 color space and uses HLG curves. One thing I should tell you though, as I'm editing the video right now, I'm just gonna jump in here. Um, HDR footage is more of a pro level thing, so I just wanna make that very clear real quick. When you use HDR footage, it'll look great on the phone itself because it knows how to process that footage. Bring that footage into any other device almost and it will look more flat and the colors more muted. That's because HDR footage is supposed to be edited in something like DaVinci Resolve, which I know my way around, and I was able to figure out how to make it look more or less how it looked on the phone. So just remember, HDR footage looks great as you are recording it, but once you bring it anywhere else, it might look a little bit different. The result of having all of these settings available for all of the focal lengths is just better versatility. Even if you choose to go far in the telephoto range so that you can shoot with some nice foreground elements there, you still are able to do 120 frames per second. You still have HDR for a bit of a color boost. And then you can go wide and turn the phone around for classic wide vlogging shots, and you still have the HDR with 120 frames on, and you also get the benefit of the face and eye detect autofocus. The experience of using the different lenses and focal lengths in the Xperia 1 Mark IV is still basically the smartphone equivalent of changing prime lenses. But at least when you are going among them now, you don't lose out on capability, and the quality seems to be basically maintained. And since I was using the phone for a long walk over at the LE Arboretum, I had a lot of thoughts, so this is the part where the video gets a little long. See, by unifying the hardware as much as possible, it just makes the shooting experience less cumbersome. Now, I know what you might be thinking. 
The Pro applications in here are kind of contrary to what most of us expect a smartphone point and shoot experience to be. I hear you there. And the Xperia 1 Mark IV still strikes me as a shooting experience that leans toward the more expert level shooter that wants all of that minute control in the device that fits best in their pocket. But so far, I think the accessibility of this camera system is getting better. So here, if I turn on the Photo Pro app by holding down the shutter button, we can go into here and it always goes to this basic mode. Now in basic mode, you still have access to things like HDR recording. If I go over to movie mode, here we go, HDR. Uh, you have access to the various zoom ranges, even if they're not measured in millimeters anymore. And like I showed a second ago, you can easily change between photo and video modes and even the front and rear cameras easily with one hand. Plenty of the photos and videos that I got so far were done shooting this way, and I felt like I got some pretty good results. And that's what most users will want all the time, is that point and shoot experience. It does require the right scenes and scenarios, but that's a pitfall that we've known about Sony Xperia already. Aside from like some AI scene recognition and some automatic HDR capture, the pictures you're getting from the system aren't going to be heavily doctored in the background after you press that shutter. Pictures in well-lit situations, to my eyes, are still sharp and more or less accurate to the scenes. They just don't get all that computational magic that evens out the highlights and the shadows. I kept coming back to the same thought as I took these comparison shots with my Pixel 6 Pro. Putting aside the lack of a dedicated night mode in the Xperia, I am not mad at what it was giving me compared to the Pixel. It's just that the Xperia results feel more clinical, and I don't mean that in a bad way. They're just straight out of the lens with far less frills. And of course, if auto, or in this case basic, didn't satisfy me with its results, it's just a quick turn of the dial and the tinkerer in me can make it work. Not everyone is like me, I admit, but the tools are there and I wouldn't say the quality is so far behind that it limits the Xperia's abilities or its fun factor. It's just an example of how smartphones can prioritize one thing over the other. And I think that the Xperia 1 Mark IV has exceptional hardware now and mostly a hands-off software approach while pretty much everyone else focuses on software enhancements on top of generally mixed hardware. I mean, for example, we have plenty of flagship smartphones that don't have 4K on the front. Their ultra wide don't have autofocus or their telephotos are just kind of subpar. But here on the Xperia, the hardware is trying to be as good as it can be throughout the range. Clearly, I've had a lot to say about the cameras on this phone already, so before this video gets way too long, let me just reiterate that I'll be giving more thoughts on the cameras in future content, especially because I plan on using this as a main shooter in some key scenarios, including travel. There's a lot to cover, clearly, so subscribe to my channel for more looks through the lenses of the Xperia 1 Mark IV. I mean, as per usual, Xperia's are just hard to cover in only one video. It's easy to dismiss every minute detail that Sony shoves into their smartphones, but honestly, it's a strategy that I love seeing because it shows us how far smartphones can actually go. I mean, everyone can benefit from having the biggest, the latest, the highest powered everything if they want it. And now more than ever, Sony's flagship seems to be striking the balance of making all of that available while making it a little more accessible with a whole possibly overwhelming world of control available just underneath that surface. It is true that doing the most also means asking the most of its users, and the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV might be priced accordingly. But with more gaps in the Xperia 1 lineup getting addressed, this could be a perfect hybrid of a smartphone, a gaming machine, and a camera, and I'm gonna continue to find out. This video is not sponsored, but I do want to thank Sony for letting me check out a prototype model of the Xperia 1 Mark IV and for really giving me the time to get to know it. For all that this smartphone sets out to do, it's going to take more time and I'll be sure to share what I can, so please do subscribe to stay tuned. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and call it on this one. Thank you so much for watching. Please take care of yourselves and each other and enjoy your tea, everybody. Woo.